as we look at this question, we understand it is one diagram based question asking us which of the following mark structure is representing neurocrine gland. Depending upon the manner of secretion, the glands can be neurocrine or apocrine or holocrine. Now, focusing upon this diagram, we understand it is a section taken from the skin specimen. As you see, this is the hair follicle and the lining of the skin epithelium, as we understand, is stratified squamous epithelium and it is keratinized also. Now, skin is keratinized which can make the skin dry, which you cannot have. So, you must have some lubrication and uh, moistening. The lubrication is done by the sebaceous gland and moistening is done by the sweat gland. So, as we see here, in the skin there will be epidermis and then there is dermis. What you find here is the root of the hair follicle and this is the hair follicle itself. An opening near the hair follicle is the duct of sebaceous gland. So, this is the marker A is the sebaceous gland which is a holocrine variety of gland. There is a total disintegration of the cells and the secretion the sebum is coming out through the duct opening near the follicle and works as lubrication on the surface of the skin. Then you will notice there is a section which has been taken in the deeper dermis and it is marker B. It is the section from the sweat gland. We will be modifying these sections but the sweat gland are mostly a crine variety which is also called merocrine variety. Here only the secretions are coming and there will be no loss of cell membrane. Now the sweat gland itself can be the crine variety or apocrine variety which will be distinguishing in the next diagram. But mostly the sweat gland is a crine variety. Now along with that you can see the marker D. This is the collection of fat cells, adipocytes. So adipose tissue. Let us look at those details now in another diagram. So as we understand in the skin there will be epidermis and the dermis. Epidermis is stratified squamous epithelium with keratinized distribution. So these are the hair follicles which are coming from the dermis region towards the epidermis region. Now this is the epidermis and below the epidermis is the dermis. Dermis will have two components. There is superficial papillary layer of dermis as you can see some of the papilla hair and then there is a deep reticular layer of dermis. You can mention it here. The dermis is a thin layer which is superficial superficial called as the papillary layer of dermis whereas the deep is the reticular layer and there comes a question which type of connective tissue will you find in these layers. So you can mention if it is the papillary layer superficial layer then you will have loose areolar connective tissue that means in this region of the dermis this area will be loose areolar connective tissue whereas the deep reticular layer of dermis will be dense irregular connective tissue. So that you can mention here the deep reticular layer will be having dense irregular connective tissue. Collagen fibers arranged in irregular fashion. Then coming to the still deeper structure is hypodermis where you can have the adipose tissue. So here as you notice this is the hypodermis which is having the adipose tissue as we have seen in a section which we were given in the exam and in the hypodermis you have the neurovascular bundle, the artery vein and the nerves. You can see that the neurovascular bundle is moving towards the root of the hair follicle which is itself in the dermis and then the follicle is moving towards the epidermis and comes out on the surface. Along with that you can see the sebaceous gland. We were talking about the holocrine variety of gland. So here the disintegration of cells will be creating sebum poured into the duct and then comes out along with the hair follicle for lubrication of the skin surface. And for moistening you'll have the sweat gland. Now the sweat glands are two types. You'll find that most of the sweat glands are acrine variety. There is no loss of cell membrane and the secretions are coming onto the surface and moistening the skin. Whereas sometime will have apocrine variety of sweat gland. Apical cell membrane is lost making a covering around the secretions forming some bleb like structures and those secretions can then be poured into the sides of the follicle. Now how will you differentiate between the two type of sweat glands that we will see in a histological specimen. But one thing is apocrine variety of sweat glands are very few in number and they can be seen in the axilla or in the perigenital area. There comes a question where you do not have the acrine type of sweat gland. In that case you will mention acrine sweat glands are missing from the margins of the lip, the nail beds, the labia minora, the clitoris. These are some of the examples where you will have apocrine type of sweat glands. And as I mentioned that apocrine glands are present in the axilla and perigenital area. What I mean to say is there will be some merocrine glands but along with that there will be apocrine sweat glands also. So it's a mixed population 
circulation in the axilla and perigenital area. You will have not only apocrine truck glands but also the eccrine truck glands. Now let us look at the section of the various glands in histological pattern. So as we were mentioning there are three type of glands according to the pattern of secretion. The mirocrine which is also called as the eccrine variety you can mention here mirocrine or the eccrine and then we have the other variety which is the apocrine and then we have the holocrine. Now what is the difference between the three? In the mirocrine you have no loss of cell membrane and the secretions are coming out as secretory vesicles. Whereas in the apocrine variety you will see apical cell membrane is lost. There are some blood formation. The apical cell membrane is covering the secretions and then holocrine the entire cell membrane is lost. The cell organelles are lost. There is a total disintegration of cells and it becomes a secretion. For example it is the sebum in the sebaceous gland. It is holocrine variety. Now histologically as you will notice if you compare the mirocrine with the apocrine. You see in this diagram these two are the glands. The darker staining structures are the ducts. So we are not focusing upon the ducts at the moment. We focus upon the glands. You look at the lumen of the gland. The lumen of the gland. No loss of cell membrane so it is smooth. But if you compare the mirocrine glands with the apocrine gland you will find the lumen is uh, larger and the surface is not smooth. There is zigzag boundaries. So that means there is loss of some cell membrane and which is covering the secretions. Thus the smooth appearance of the lumen is lost. You see the lumen is quite smaller and smooth but here the lumen is larger and having zigzag pattern. And moreover the mirocrine glands they stain lighter pink. Less of eosin is taken but in apocrine there is slightly darker pink. More of eosin is taken. So one is lighter and other is darker. Which type of epithelium is present in these glands? Though it will appear as pseudostatified cells but they are in fact simple cuboidal or simple columnar epithelium. Now may it be the mirocrine variety or the apocrine variety. The cells are simple cuboidal or simple columnar cells. Cuboidal should be your first answer. And if you are comparing them with the ducts, first of all the ducts are darker. As you see the ducts take more of your sin, more pinkish and the ducts will have stratified cuboidal epithelium. So double layer of cuboidal cells as are evident here. Now may it be mirocrine or the apocrine variety. The ducts are appearing similar. And then coming to the sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland cells are quite paler if you compare them with the apocrine variety or the mirocrine variety. Now we are zooming the sebaceous gland here and as you will notice these cells are paler with central nucleus and towards the duct. As you will find the cells are getting disintegrated. All the cell organelles, cell membranes are being lost and entirety they are becoming sebum. The sebum is coming along the hair follicle in the duct and thus goes along with the hair follicle to the skin surface. So this is the typical appearance of the sebaceous gland. And now we can come back to our question which is asking which of the following marked structure is mirocrine gland. Mirocrine or eccrine gland can be the strut gland and here we see the sections of the strut gland. As we have mentioned mostly the strut glands are mirocrine variety in the deeper dermis and marker B should be our answer. Now when you say the answer is marker B what about the marker A? The marker A as we can see is the sebaceous gland. It is holocrine variety and this is the marker C which is the root of the hair follicle where some neurovascular bundle will be coming and marker D is the hypodermis where you will have the adipocytes, adipose tissue in the deeper dermis, basically hypodermis. So we'll keep our answer as choice number B here, the mirocrine variety of sweat glands. This question is asking us to arrange the following cells in basal to liminal side order. As you go through the names, it will be understood that we are talking about the seminiferous tubules here. Now before we look at the histological specimen of the seminiferous tubules, let us have a line diagram to understand few details. Process of spermatogenesis takes 74 days and it is happening in the seminiferous tubules of the testis. And as we talk about the basal 
to liminal side order, you can describe this is the territory of seminiferous tubules. And here will be the liminal side where we will find the free spermatozoa. So how the spermatozoa are formed? That is what we will find from the basal towards the liminal side. There are some cells undergoing mitosis and meiosis and eventually forming the free sperm. The sperms will be in the lumen and they are not a part of the epithelium which is multiple layered. So which cell is towards the periphery or towards the basal side on the basement membrane? On the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubule we find the first cell and it is the spermatogonium and the spermatogonium is undergoing mitosis. It will produce the next cell which is called as the primary spermatocyte and this primary spermatocyte is now entering meiosis 1 to give us the secondary spermatocyte but you have to be careful the secondary spermatocyte are rarely seen in the histological specimens because very quickly they will enter meiosis 2 to form the spermatids and the spermatids now they will be changing into what is called as the free spermatozoa in the lumen. Now how do you identify these cells undergoing mitosis first and then meiosis 1, meiosis 2. First of all the cell towards the basement membrane towards the basal region is the spermatogonium. So towards the periphery will be the layer of spermatogonium. Mostly we identify these cells by looking at the nucleus and the difference between spermatogonium and primary spermatocyte is in the primary spermatocyte there is clumped chromatin. This clumped chromatin is not seen in the spermatogonium. We will be finding it in one histological picture and as I said the secondary spermatocyte is mostly not evident in any of the histological specimen. So how do you identify the spermatid? Spermatid will be a smaller cell with a round nucleus. The chromatin is not that evident now. In fact if you look at all of these cells the largest of all the cell is primary spermatocyte. You can mention here the primary spermatocyte is the largest of all these cells in this sequence. And how do you identify the spermatocyte? First of all, it is not a part of epithelium, it is free in the lumen and will have very small condensed nucleus with the tail. Now, along with these germ cells will have the supporting cell, the Sertoli cell. You can draw the Sertoli cell here. Sertoli cell is a large columnar cell and it will have multiple interdigitating processes and it is traversing almost all the distance from the basal to the luminal side and it has a large nucleus with prominent nucleolus. So this is the Sertoli cell. As we are mentioning, Sertoli cell will have a large nucleus with prominent nucleoli with multiple processes and is reaching from basal towards the liminal side. Similarly, we can draw one more Sertoli cell on the other side. So this is another Sertoli cell and what they do is they will be holding hands with the neighbor Sertoli cell, making the cell junctions, the tight junctions. And the purpose of making these tight junctions holding hand is to create blood testis barrier. We understand that the sperms are formed after puberty. Spermatogenesis begins after puberty. So sperms are like a foreign body to the blood cells because they have never seen sperms. They were not trained to treat the sperm as self cell. And in case the blood cells are exposed to the sperms, there will be some autoantibodies formed and sperms can be destroyed. So these blood vessels which are outer to the seminiferous tubules, these blood vessels and the components should not be exposed to the developing sperms and that is why the blood cells and components are not allowed to move towards the sperm side because of these Sertoli cells making tight junctions. These tight junctions they allow the germ cells to move towards the lumen but not the components of blood vessels. This is blood testis barrier. The Sertoli cell has some other functions also. It is a nurse cell for nutrition purpose and it is also giving us some of the hormones like it will be giving millerian inhibiting substance. During development the Sertoli cells are giving the millerian inhibiting substance so that it will inhibit the millerian duct, inhibit the female feature then only the male features develop here. And the other hormone it is giving is inhibin. Inhibin is the hormone which is having a feedback mechanism towards the pituitary. The Sertoli cells will be giving us inhibin which will be giving a negative feedback to the pituitary and pituitary will reduce the secretion of follicle stimulating hormone. And along with these functions, the Sertoli cell is also degrading or reducing the amount of cytoplasm in the spermatid in the process of spermiogenesis. 
so that finally when the sperms are formed they are very small cell with the least possible content along with them so in the process of spermiogenesis we need the sertoli cell function now before we look at the histological specimen you have to understand the cell which is helping these sperms to move further in the seminiferous tubule is the myoid cell and these myoid cell which are seen at the periphery we can draw these myoid cells they are connective tissue cells having the feature of smooth muscle cells and these myoid cells they are helping in contraction of the seminiferous tubule they have flat nucleus they are flat cells with flat nucleus and they are having the contractile function as they do the contraction the sperms which are in the luminum they can be moving further towards the urethra because the sperms have to be ejaculated through the urethra so as you can see in this particular question you have got your answer you want to enumerate the cell from basal to luminal side so which cell is towards the base the outermost is the myoid cell and after myoid cell you'll have the spermatogonium next will be the nucleus of the sertoli cell and then you have the nucleus of primary spermatocyte then second is spermatocyte the spermatid and the sperm so the outermost is the myoid cell as you search for the myoid cell which is also called myofibroblast should be towards the base so we have to search for an option where we begin with number five and you can see choice number abc could be our answer but now after five what we need is the spermatogonium so we have to search for the spermatogonium which is number one so after five we need number one as you can see in here after five number one is in choice number b so if we are marking the choice number b as our answer it is seen from the basal to the luminal side the shell number five myofibroblast is followed by number one which is spermatogonium which is then followed by number three the primary spermatocyte and then we'll have number four the spermatid and finally towards the lumen we'll have number two which is the spermatozoa so choice number b is our answer but we have to look at one histological specimen now here we have taken a section from the testis we understand that testis will have a tunica albuginea sending the septum inside and dividing the testis into seminiferous tubules sperms will develop in seminiferous tubules will be moving towards the straight tubules and rete testis then efferent ductules then the epididymis and from epididymis it will move on towards the ductus deferens and then towards the urethra the sperms can then be ejaculated but remember the sperms they gain their motility only in the epididymis it is the epididymis which will be helping us in giving progressive motility to the sperm so before the epididymis how do the sperm move they are moved by the myoid cells that's what we were talking about these are the flat cell with flat nucleus towards the periphery outer side and these myoid cells or myofibroblasts they are contractile cells and they are helping the sperm to move towards the epididymis and these myoid cells they also secrete connective tissue the interstitial tissue surrounding the seminiferous tubules so they are towards the periphery towards the basal level and as we move towards the luminal side we have already discussed first of all we'll have the spermatogonium spermatogonium are towards the outer side identified by the fact they do not have clumped chromatin the clumped chromatin will come in primary spermatocyte which is fourth in sequence because the outermost cell is myoid cell number one number two is the spermatogonium number three is the large elongated cell the sertoli cell this is the large nucleus with the prominent nucleoli and number four is the primary spermatocyte and we mentioned secondary spermatocytes are not usually seen so directly we are seeing the spermatid a small cell with small nucleus among the germ cells the largest cell is the primary spermatocyte but still larger is the sertoli cell now we have to be careful if the nucleus is seen towards the outside of sertoli cell it is spermatogonium and if nucleus is seen towards the inner side luminal side of sertoli cell then it is primary spermatocyte so i'll repeat the sequence again number one the myoid cell number two spermatogonium number three is the sertoli cell nucleus number four primary spermatocyte and then secondary spermatocyte spermatid and the spermatozoa now we have to zoom in this area and try to identify these cells as we do so it is understood that these black arrows as evident here number one towards the basement membrane and number two towards the basement membrane and number three towards the basement membrane number four 
therefore towards the basement membrane are the spermatogonium. What is still outside here? The flat cell with flat nucleus. These are the myoid cells. And these myoid cells, they help in contraction of the seminiferous tubule to move the spermatocytes which are inside the lumen. And they also secrete corrective tissue of the interstitial cells. Now, this is the first germ cell, which is the next germ cell. As you see, the next germ cell shown by the red arrows clump the chromatin and more towards the liminal side is the primary spermatocyte. So here is another primary spermatocyte shown by red arrow and here another one. The primary spermatocyte, primary spermatocyte. And the secondary spermatocytes are not usually evident so directly we will have the blue arrow, the spermatids, small cell with small nucleus and they have now changed into the spermatozoa, smallest of the nuclei among all and they are not part of the epithelium they are free in the lumen so these are the spermatocytes which are free in the lumen and then we can talk about the Sertoli cells as we understand the peripheral cell is the spermatogonium and then we have the primary spermatocyte we are looking at their nuclei and between them is the nucleus of Sertoli cell a large cell with large nucleus if you look at the Sertoli cell peripheral to that is spermatogonium and towards the liminal side is primary spermatocyte. So this is one of the nucleus of Sertoli cell. Another one you can see here or here. So this is spermatogonium and these are the primary spermatocytes. This is the nucleus of Sertoli cell or you can see the Sertoli cell nucleus here. These are Sertoli cells. This is the spermatogonium. This is the primary spermatocyte. So in a sequence you can see when you find the nucleus of Sertoli cell towards the periphery is the spermatogonium and towards the liminal side is primary spermatocyte. And if we are talking about the interstitial cells of Leydig, they are large polygonal cells outside the seminiferous tubule. Interstitial cells of Leydig, they are large polygonal cells having pinkish appearance and they are giving us the hormone testosterone. This is a diagram based question which is asking us mentioning about the arterial supply of the marked structure and the arrow mark is on the rostrum of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is collection of axons which are commercial fibers connecting the right brain with the left brain crossing the midline. As we understand the left brain is for language processing and the right brain is for spatial orientation and there is a communication through the corpus callosum. In past there used to be a treatment cutting the corpus callosum in the midline to treat epileptic disorders. But if you do that, then there will be a split brain syndrome where the right brain cannot communicate with the left brain and will have some deteriorating implications. Anyhow, this question is asking us about arterial supply. So this is the area where we will have circle of villus and various contributing arteries. Let us draw a diagram for the circle of villus. As we understand, there are two arteries contributing to the circle of village. From the anterior side, there is internal carotid artery, one on each side, right and left. And on the posterior side, there are two vertebral arteries, right and left, forming the basilar artery. Now, looking from the base of the brain, you can see these are the two vertebral arteries. They ascend up and then they unite to form the basilar artery. So, vertebro basilar system. And this is on the brain stem. Then, this basilar artery is dividing into two posterior cerebral arteries arteries which will be contributing to the circle of villus. Now what about the anterior and middle cerebral arteries then? The anterior and middle cerebral arteries will be contributed by internal carotid artery system which you can show now. Here is internal carotid artery on either side and it is now giving us middle cerebral artery on either side and also along with the middle cerebral artery it will be giving the anterior cerebral arteries. So we are showing them here the anterior cerebral arteries as well. Number one anterior cerebral artery, number two middle cerebral artery, number three posterior cerebral artery and all the three are going to supply the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is also supplied by one more artery and that you can mark here the anterior communicating artery. The anterior communicating artery is communicating the two anterior cerebral arteries. So what are the branches given to the corpus callosum by these arteries? When you are talking about the anterior cerebral artery, it will supply most of the corpus callosum to 
towards the midline and the name of the branch is pericalosal artery. We will have a diagram to discuss that as well. Then there is supply from anterior communicating artery and the name of the branch given by anterior communicating artery is called as median callosal artery or subcallosal artery. Now once we have mentioned about that there is one more callosal artery which is given by posterior cerebral artery and it is called posterior pericallosal artery. So this posterior cerebral artery is giving a branch called posterior pericallosal artery. Now we have got three callosal arteries supplying the corpus callosum. As we can see there is pericallosal artery branch of anterior cerebral artery. Number two it is the median or subcallosal artery branch of anterior communicating artery and then posterior pericallosal artery coming from posterior cerebral artery. Then what is the role of middle cerebral artery? Since the middle cerebral artery is not supplying the medial cerebrum area, it will not supply the corpus callosum near the midline. But then we have to understand corpus callosum is intercommunicating fibers. They will reach the lateral aspect also. So lateral aspect of corpus callosum will be supplied by the artery on the lateral cerebrum which is middle cerebral artery. So that means even the middle cerebral artery will be supplying the corpus callosum not by giving any callosal branch but just the lateral part of corpus callosum. So this way we have four arteries supplying the corpus callosum. The middle cerebral artery is supplying lateral portion of corpus callosum without having any named branches. Now before we reach our answer we have to understand which part of the corpus callosum they are asking for and that can be discussed in the next slide. Here we are looking from the lateral view. We have taken a sagittal section of the brain and talking about the commissural fibers. The first commissure to develop is the anterior commissure which is connecting the olfactory region. So here you can see this is the anterior commissure, the first commissure to develop and you can demarcate that here as well. This is the region where we have the anterior commissure, the first commissure to develop. The next to develop is the fornix. And and this is the region of the fornix. Fornix is again collection of axons connecting the right sided brain with the left sided brain. For example, hippocampus of one side connected to hippocampus of other side. Fornix having commissural fibers. So here, this is the fornix region. As you can see, the second commissure to develop. The third commissure to develop is the corpus callosum and is the largest commission. It will have several parts. The very first part you can see here is the rostrum. So let us demarcate the rostrum portion of the corpus callosum here and as we do so this is the region of the rostrum of corpus callosum. Now this rostrum is connecting the orbitofrontal cortex of one side with the other right and left side connection. Orbitofrontal cortex above the orbits is broadband area number 10 and 11. It is important for decision making. Now coming to the next part there is a bend in the corpus callosum and that is called as the genu. Genu is connecting the prefrontal cortex of right side with the left side. So let us mark the genu here. This is the genu part of corpus callosum connecting the prefrontal cortex of right and left side. Then comes the body or the trunk and this trunk is connecting not only the frontal cortex but also parietal cortex and even the temporal cortex of right with left side. The first answer should always be parietal cortex. Second it is temporal cortex. Third it is frontal cortex. So as we are marking the body or the trunk region it is understood it is connecting the parietal cerebrum and the temporal as well as partly frontal. For example frontal motor cortex, parietal sensory cortex of right side connected with left side. After the body we will find there is the splenium posteriorly and splenium can be identified as it is lying above the cerebellum here. So this is the splenium and and is obvious that splenium will be connecting the occipital cortex. But then not only the splenium is connecting the occipital cortex, it also connects partly the parietal cortex of right side with the left side. Now what will happen if there is ischemic infarction of the splenium? Then the patient develops what is called as dyslexia, difficulty in reading. But this dyslexia is without agraphia, means the patient can see and can draw but cannot read. It is 
a lesion in the blood supply of the splenium what about the infarction in the region of the anterior part of corpus callosum there the patient can develop dyspraxia agnosia and what is dyspraxia difficulty in coordination of the movement or agnosia like tactile agnosia cannot identify the objects by touching them difficulty in processing the information sensory perception so anterior lesions can result in dyspraxia agnosia posterior lesions can result in dyslexia but without agraphia now coming to the arterial supply we will repeat the information we already have gathered as we discussed there are two arteries contributing to circle of willis at the base of brain anteriorly the internal carotid artery posteriorly the vertebral artery it is the internal carotid artery which is giving us the branches known as anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery but the middle cerebral artery is going to the lateral aspect of the cerebrum and it will be supplying the corpus callosum with the no named branches and will supply the lateral part of the corpus callosum but then medially you'll have one more artery contributing the two vertebral arteries they unite to form the basilar artery at the base of pons in front of brain stem and then this artery gives posterior cerebral artery so you can see the posterior cerebral artery supplying the posterior cerebrum the greenish area here and also supplying the splenium part of corpus callosum posteriorly if there is a block in the vertebro basilar system or posterior cerebral artery then the splenium part of corpus callosum is compromised leading to dyslexia without agraphia patient cannot read the word but can draw it as such now the branch which posterior cerebral artery is giving is called as posterior pericallosal artery but then on the medial aspect most of the supply is by anterior cerebral artery giving the pericallosal artery so here you can see internal carotid artery has given the anterior cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery is giving pericallosal artery supplying most of the corpus callosum starting from the rostrum or genu or the body we have also mentioned there will be one anterior communicating artery which is giving subcallosal or median callosal artery supplying part of the anterior corpus callosum not evident here so if it comes to rostrum of the corpus callosum major artery supply will be the anterior cerebral artery with additional branches from anterior communicating artery this is about the medial aspect but if you look at the lateral aspect of corpus callosum then middle cerebral artery is contributing to see that let us take a coronal section of the brain and look at the corpus callosum from the front view and as is evident in this coronal section from the front view this is the internal carotid artery which is giving anterior cerebral artery on either side and middle cerebral artery which goes to the lateral aspect of the cerebrum now as we have discussed the anterior cerebral artery which is evident here and the anterior communicating artery they will be supplying the medial aspect of corpus callosum here you can demarcate the corpus callosum yourself this is the corpus callosum which is connecting the two sides of the cerebrum and as you can see on the medial aspect it is the territory of anterior cerebral artery the pink color plus it is also being supplied by anterior communicating artery anterior communicating artery giving subcallosal branch anterior cerebral artery giving the pericallosal artery but then as you go laterally the lateral part of the corpus callosum is being supplied by the territory of middle cerebral artery so as you can see middle cerebral artery will supply the lateral part of corpus callosum corpus callosum if it is towards the midline it is being supplied by anterior cerebral artery anterior communicating artery and if it is lateral part of corpus callosum it is supplied by middle cerebral artery which is seen here so coming back to our question now this arrow mark is on the rostrum part of the corpus callosum hence the very first answer should be anterior cerebral artery and then anterior communicating artery plus the middle cerebral artery so we have to search for the options and i will go with the option number c anterior cerebral artery and anterior communicating artery as we have discussed the anterior cerebral artery will be giving us pericallosal artery supplying anterior part of corpus callosum plus anterior communicating artery is giving us the subcallosal artery which is additional contribution to blood supply now why have you not included the middle cerebral artery because even the middle cerebral artery is supplying the corpus callosum laterally that is because we do not have any such option with us and all the authors they mention only these two arteries though logically the third artery should also be mentioned in the theory books which we do not find as such so we'll keep our answer as choice number c here
the arterial supply to the rostrum of the corpus callosum. The question is asking us about one of the foramen which is located between three bones and for that purpose the choices given are foramen rotundum, lacerum, magnum and jugular foramen. Before we look at a diagram to discuss the same we are drawing a schematic diagram. We have removed the brain and looking at the cranial fossa which are three in number the anterior cranial fossa, middle and posterior cranial fossa. So here you can see looking at the base of the cranial fossa which is anterior cranial fossa, middle and the posterior cranial fossa we will discuss these foramina. Now in the midline there is the bone sphenoid. It will have a butterfly shaped structure, body of sphenoid, a lesser wing and a greater wing. So we are drawing it here. This is the body of the sphenoid which is found at the floor of anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa and also posterior cranial fossa. So this body of sphenoid is now having a greater wing, lesser wing. The lesser wing is at the floor of anterior cranial fossa as shown here and the greater wing is at the floor of middle cranial fossa as we can demarcate it here. So this is the greater wing and the lesser wing of the butterfly the sphenoid bone. Then in the posterior cranial fossa we have the occipital bone. So this is the territory of the occipital bone in which you will have the foramen magnum. So foramen magnum is a large foramen which is found in the occipital bone at the floor of posterior cranial fossa. Between the sphenoid and the occipital bone we have petrous part of temporal bone which can be shown here and the apex of petrous temporal bone comes to the body of sphenoid. So this is petrous temporal bone. We understand that the ear is located inside the petrous temporal bone. Now this is just an approximation. It is a schematic line diagram but if you are talking about the jugular foramen you can locate the jugular foramen now here. The jugular foramen is located between the temporal bone and the occipital bone and through the jugular foramen pass the jugular vein, internal jugular vein along with cranial nerve number 9, 10 and 11. So as you can see between the occipital bone and the temporal bone we have the jugular foramen having jugular vein, internal jugular vein which drain the brain and along with that run cranial nerve number 9, 10, 11. Now what about the foramen rotundum? As you talk about the foramen rotundum or ovale or spinosum this ROS foramen rotundum Rotundum, foramen ovale and foramen spinosum. They are in the greater wing of the sphenoid and when it comes to the foramen lacerum it is bounded by the three bones. You will see at the apex of petrous temporal bone we have a foramen with lacerated margins. As you magnify this diagram you will find this is the region of the foramen lacerum and as is evident the foramen lacerum is bounded by the three bones having a lacerated margin. So which three bones? The foramen lacerum is bounded by basilar part of occipital bone, apex of the petrous temporal bone and then the greater wing of sphenoid, the roots of pterygoid process of the sphenoid and foramen lacerum is not a true and through foramen means if you take a probe and try to pass it through and through your probe will be stuck at the base because at the floor of foramen lacerum there is a plate of cartilage. It is a closed foramen though several structures will be passing through that. So which structures are passing through foramen lacerum we would like to know but as such if we are talking about this question in this question we understand the answer should be foramen lacerum because it is the foramen which is bounded by the three bones. As you talk about foramen rotundum, it is only within a single bone, the greater wing of sphenoid and if it is foramen magnum, it is within a single bone that is the occipital bone. If it comes to the foramen jugular foramen, it is bounded by two bones, medially it is the occipital bone, laterally the temporal bone. So keeping our answer as foramen lacerum, let us look at one more diagram. As we discussed, it is a superior view of the cranial cavity, we remove the skull cap, remove the brain and look at the floor of cranial fossa which is anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa. This is the sphenoid bone. The body of sphenoid is extending into floor of anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa. There is a primary cartilaginous joint, synchondrosis between the body of sphenoid and the occipital bone in the posterior cranial fossa, synchondrosis. And related to this synchondrosis is the foramen lacerum bonded by the three 
three bones. Let us magnify this area now. And as we do that, it is to be mentioned the foramen lacerum is bounded by the apex of the petrous temporal bone, the basal part of occipital bone, and the greater wing root of tergoid process of the sphenoid bone. This is foramen lacerum on either side. And if you are looking for foramen rotundum, this is foramen rotundum in the greater wing of sphenoid. Rotundum, ovale, and the spinosum. And the jugular foramen, this is jugular foramen which is bounded between two bones, medially the occipital bone, laterally the temporal bone. Jugular foramen where you have jugular vein, internal jugular vein, along with the number 9, 10, 11. And this is the foramen magnum in the occipital bone through which will be passing lower part of medulla oblongata, on which you will see two vertebral arteries along with spinal accessory nerve in the subarachnoid space. Now, what is the clinical importance of foramen lacerum? Actually, there can be extension of some tumors which are extracranial into the cranial cavity, the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, angiofibroma. Plus, it has some emissary veins connecting extracranial cavity with the intracranial cavity. Here will be the cavernous sinus connected to the emissary veins and inferiorly there will be pterygoid venous plexus. So, spread of infection from extracranial to intracranial cavity through the foramen lacerum because of those emissary veins. And then we have to discuss another diagram for more details. Looking at the foramen lacerum once again from the superior view, we have to mention that internal carotid artery as it comes into the cranial cavity passes through the foramen lacerum and then become a content of the cavernous sinus, comes out of cavernous sinus and gives some intracranial branches like the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery. But before that, it is in the cavernous sinus and before that it is passing through the foramen lacerum. This is the foramen lacerum which we have mentioned is bounded by the apex of petrous temporal bone here, the base of the occipital bone here and then the greater wing root of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. So this is the foramen lacerum which is shown open here but in living subjects it will be covered by a plate of cartilage. So no structure can pass through and through. Then how come this internal carotid artery is reaching the foramen lacerum? We will be discussing that in the next diagram. This is looking from the lateral view. We will find that internal carotid artery is going to enter the cranial cavity passing the temporal bone takes a turn and then enters the cranial cavity but then it is passing through the foramen lacerum and in the foramen lacerum which is a closed foramen because of one cartilage at the floor the artery will be passing and then entering the cavernous sinus. So the carotid artery enters at the base of skull through carotid canal in the temporal bone reaches the foramen lacerum and comes out of foramen lacerum to enter cavernous sinus. In the foramen lacerum let us discuss five structures now. Number one, the internal carotid artery itself and number two, the T1 sympathetic plexus around the artery and number three, the deep petrosal nerve which is given by the T1 sympathetic plexus and number four, there is a greater petrosal nerve branch of the facial nerve reaching for a lacerum and number five, the formation of median nerve of pterygoid canal. So you can remember GDP here, one of the mnemonic. G is the greater petrosal nerve, D is the deep petrosal nerve and T is the nerve of pterygoid canal. It is the greater petrosal nerve joining the deep petrosal nerve to form the pterygoid nerve. Greater petrosal nerve, a branch of facial nerve, deep petrosal nerve is coming from T1 sympathetic plexus around internal carotid artery and together they join to form the median nerve of pterygoid canal. The greater petrosal has the parasympathetic fibers and the deep petrosal has the sympathetic fibers. So median nerve will have sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers reaching the pterygopalatine ganglion also called sphenopalatine ganglion which is then controlling the LNP gland L for the lacrimal and for the nasal P for the palatine gland. So secretion of the lacrimal gland, nasal gland, palatine gland is under pterygopalatine ganglion which itself receives these secretomotor fibers from median nerve of pterygoid canal. If you have a case of vasomotor rhinitis running nose with intractable rhinorrhea in that case you can cut the vidian nerve. As you cut the vidian nerve you are cutting the sympathetic fibers as well as parasympathetic fibers and the patient can have relief of symptoms from the running nose. Though these days you better spray oxymetazoline, xylometazoline here to take care of running nose. Don't 
not do with an ectomy. And two more structures are passing through foramen lacerum. As we have discussed one already, the emissary veins connecting extracranial pterygoid venous plexus with the intracranial cavernous sinus, so emissary veins. And one meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery is also passing through the foramen lacerum. So total seven contents of the foramen lacerum. And as such, we already have marked our answer here. Foramen lacerum is a gap which is lying between the three bones. The three bones, choice number B should remain our answer here. The question which we have got here is asking which of the following structure will be passing through jugular foramen and through a separate canal. Now when we talk about jugular foramen, it will have the jugular vein, internal jugular vein and along with that cranial nerve number 9, 10, 11. Now before we choose our answer, let us draw a diagram first, which is the floor of the cranial cavity. Looking at the floor of anterior cranial fossa, middle and posterior cranial fossa. Then we understand that at the floor of the posterior cranial fossa, we have a bone, the occipital bone. And this occipital bone, which is in the posterior cranial fossa, is related to the petrous part of temporal bone on the lateral aspect. Let us draw the petrous temporal bone as well. So here is the petrous temporal bone on either side and we have to understand that between the two we have the jugular foramen and that is where we want to focus upon. So as we magnify this diagram we are looking at the content of the jugular foramen bounded by two bones medially the occipital bone laterally the petrous temporal bone. Now, in this jugular foramen, we have the formation of internal jugular vein. Let us magnify this diagram and show its content there. So here we have magnified the diagram of the jugular foramen and we have to understand the cranial cavity is draining into dural venous sinuses, which will finally drain their blood in the internal jugular vein, which is beginning at the level of jugular foramen. So there will be one inferior petrosal sinus coming from anterior side and there will be a sigmoid sinus coming from the posterior side and together they will be joining to form internal jugular vein. In fact, the sigmoid sinus continues as internal jugular vein inferiorly once it receives inferior petrosal sinus. So let us show both of them here. Anteriorly comes the inferior petrosal sinus which has to join the sigmoid sinus located posteriorly and once the inferior petrosal sinus joins the sigmoid sinus, the sigmoid sinus itself will continue as internal jugular vein. Now inferior petrosal sinus is on the anterior aspect of the jugular foramen. Sigmoid sinus is on the posterior aspect of this jugular foramen. And in the middle portion you have the number 9, 10, 11 which we are going to show now. So here is the number 9, 10 and 11. But the specific point is this nerve number 9 as it pierces through the endosteal layer of the dura mater. It will be having a separate dural sheath whereas the number 1011 will have a common dural sheath as they are piercing the endosteal layer of dura mater to exit the cranial cavity. So you can show here the number 1011 will have a separate dural sheath and that's what I understand the examiner was wanting to ask. Examiner is asking which of the following nerves pass separately through the jugular foramen and for that purpose the answer should be nerve number 9 having a separate dural sheath. Let us look at one more diagram to discuss the same details. As you can see this diagram is telling us about the occipital bone and the petrous temporal bone. Between the two we have the jugular foramen and in the jugular foramen we are having inferior petrosal sinus joining the sigmoid sinus to form internal jugular vein. The inferior petrosal sinus is more anterior, sigmoid sinus is more posterior. Once the inferior petrosal sinus drain the venous blood into sigmoid sinus, it will continue as the internal jugular vein. So this is the anterior part of jugular foramen. This is posterior part of jugular foramen. In the middle portion, you have number 9, 10, 11. But then number 9 has a separate dural sheath, whereas 10 and 11 have a combined dural sheath. It is understood that dura mater is having two layers fused together. Towards the bone, it is the endosteal dura mater, and towards the meningeus, it is meningeal dura mater. Normally, they are fused with each other, but at the level of foramina, it is seen now number 9 is piercing dura mater and becomes extra 
cranial. Now, we'll be having a separate dural sheet, whereas the number 10 and 11 will have a common dural sheet as they exit the cranial cavity. And that was our question. Now, sometimes there can be a glomus tumor, and that glomus tumor can involve the jugular foramen. In that case, there will be raised intracranial tension because you are blocking the venous drainage of cranial cavity to the exterior into internal jugular vein. There will be venous obstruction, hydrocephalus, apalledema, and all that. Along with that, we can have involvement of number 9, 10, and 11, which are controlling the muscles of palate, pharynx, and larynx. So, difficulty speech and swallowing. Plus, 11th nerve has a spinal accessory component as well. If it is compromised, then there will be a problem of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle as well. Difficulty turning the neck to the opposite side and difficulty shrugging the shoulder. The glomus tumor complications. And as we come back to our question, we already understand if you are talking about the jugular foramen and a structure having a separate canal, it is the number 9, 10, 11 which are passing here, not the number 12. And among the three also a separate canal if you say, I'll go for choice number A. So choice number A should be our answer here. Here we find a question which is asking us which of the following is not a branch of facial artery. Facial artery is running on the face and itself is a branch of the external carotid artery. It will have two portions. One is cervical portion in the neck region, then it has the facial portion. So we need to look at one diagram before we could reach our answer here. Looking at the lateral view of the face in the carotid triangle, we find common carotid artery is bifurcating into two branches external carotid artery and internal carotid artery. Now external carotid artery will be giving certain branches like there are three anterior branches, two posterior branches and two terminal branches. Anteriorly it is giving superior thyroid artery, lingual artery and the facial artery. Posteriorly it will be giving the occipital artery and the posterior auricular artery. Then the two terminal branches are maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery. Now coming to the facial artery, it is given at the superior superior corneo or the greater corneo of the hyoid bone level in the carotid triangle and it is having a cervical part. The cervical part will be giving some branches which are not shown here. So let us mark them here. As you mentioned in the cervical part there are two branches which we can show here. Number one it is the ascending palatine artery which is going to supply the palatine region and also the palatine tonsil. So in the cervical part of the facial artery the first branch we have mentioned is ascending palatine artery supplying palate including palatine tonsil. There is one tonsillar artery itself to supply palatine tonsil. So number two the tonsillar artery branch of facial artery. Now as we have marked number one and number two branches here in this diagram in the cervical part there is a third branch also we need to mention and as we will see this is going under the mentum of the mandible. So this number Number 3 artery, we are calling it as submental artery, branch of the facial artery. As evident here, coming from the cervical part of facial artery, submental artery, under the mentum of the mandible. Now, after discussing these three branches from the cervical part of facial artery, as it reaches the ramus of the mandible, it starts running on the face. And on the face, it is giving four branches, which are easy to remember because, as you see, supplying lower lip inferior labial artery supplying the upper lip so superior labial artery supplying the nose from the lateral side so lateral nasal artery and reaching the medial angle of eye the angular artery so you can mention now the branches on the face the inferior labial artery superior labial artery lateral nasal artery and the angular artery the facial artery is quite tortuous on the face to allow for the movement of the muscles and the skin and facial pulse can be be taken, we have to ask the patient to clench his teeth and activate the masseter muscle. Anterior inferior on the mandible, we can feel the pulse of the facial artery. Now, we have to talk about one anastomosis between the branches of external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery, which is also given in the carotid triangle, is going to enter the cranial cavity and give some branches. Now, as you follow the internal carotid artery, 
artery in the cranial cavity it will be giving the ophthalmic artery and that ophthalmic artery is giving a branch which is called as anterior ethmoidal artery so as we see this is the internal cardiac artery which is enter the cranial cavity and give ophthalmic artery towards the orbit which itself give anterior ethmoidal artery anterior ethmoidal artery will be giving us dorsal nasal artery which comes here to the face area so as you continue discussing the branch of anterior ethmoidal artery it is dorsal nasal artery and this dorsal nasal artery is now anastomosing with the angular artery at the medial angle of the eye so this is one anastomosis between the angular artery branch of facial artery external carotid artery and the dorsal nasal artery branch of internal carotid artery this is one anastomosis which is important in case there is a blockage in one artery the other artery will continue supplying the region now there are some other arteries which we have to focus upon we have mentioned that the external carotid artery is giving maxillary artery to supply the maxilla bone from the first part of maxillary artery comes inferior alveolar artery and it is supplying the lower teeth it will be passing in the mandibular canal and then will give a branch which is called mental artery coming out through mental foramen in the bone mandible and this mental artery which itself is a branch of inferior alveolar artery branch of the maxillary artery is going to anastomose with the submental artery and also inferior labial artery which themselves are branches of the facial artery there should be rich vascular anastomosis in case any branch is blocked the other branches will continue supplying the face region so that mental artery was in our question mental artery is not a branch of facial artery it's a branch of the maxillary artery as is evident here the facial artery gives what is called as submental artery not the mental artery now there is one more artery which we have to talk about transverse facial artery it is a branch of the superficial temporal artery the terminal branch of external carotid artery so this is the transverse facial artery which itself is supplying the face region and as i mentioned there will be multiple anastomoses so as to provide collateral circulation for the vascularity of the face which is highly vascular area and then coming back to our question which of the following is not a branch of facial artery so we have seen lateral nasal artery giving supply to the nose and we have discussed superior inferior labial arteries but the mental artery is not a branch of the facial artery what it give is sub mental artery not the mental artery hence in this particular question our answer should be choice number b mental artery is a branch of the inferior alveolar artery branch of the maxillary artery itself being a branch of the external carotid artery this question is upon the lung hilum and they are asking us the structures in the anterior to posterior relations and the structures which are present at the hilum we understand will be the bronchi the branches of pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins let us look at one diagram before we try to reach our answer here and as you see we are looking from the front view here it is understood that the trachea will be bringing the air into the lungs and the alveoli will be aerated then the heart will be sending deoxygenated blood by the pulmonary arteries into the lung there will be some alveolar gaseous exchange and oxygenated blood will then enter the pulmonary veins and come back to the heart so the same story you can mention here as well as we are going to magnify this diagram and discuss the details it is understood here that this is the trachea which brings the air is now bifurcating into right principal bronchus and the left principal bronchus and these bronchi are now going to form the root of lung and enter the hilum of the lung as is evident here the left principal bronchus and the right principal bronchus but then it is also understood right principal bronchus is short wide and more vertical as it is short it has already divided into two before it enters the hilum of the lung so you can mention here the right principal bronchus has already divided into an 
upper or superior and lower and inferior bronchi whereas on the other side left principal bronchus is longer so it has not yet divided and enters as a single opening in the left lung so left lung will have the entry point of left principal bronchus at the hilum whereas the right lung will have two bronchi instead of one we call them as epi arterial bronchus and hypo arterial bronchus as they are above and below the pulmonary artery here now what is the role of pulmonary artery as we have understood the heart which is having the deoxygenated blood will be pushing it into the pulmonary artery which divides into left pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery and carry the deoxygenated blood to the lungs the lungs will oxygenate the blood and send it back to the heart via pulmonary veins which are four in number so first we are marking the superior pulmonary vein on the left side and inferior pulmonary vein as well now this is superior inferior pulmonary vein on the left side we can also talk about them on the right side these are the pulmonary veins the superior and inferior which will be bringing the oxygenated blood to the left atrium of the heart now what we need to understand is veins have thin wall as compared with the artery which is thick wall whereas the thickest wall is with the bronchus so so as the logic will explain and is seen also the veins are most anterior posterior to that is the artery and most posterior is the bronchus thickest wall is most posterior and that is the arrangement anterior to posterior vein artery bronchus v a v so you can mention the arrangement of these structures as v a b anterior to posterior now comes a question asking us about the arrangement of structures superior to inferior and and for that purpose, you can remember one mnemonic for the left lung. Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Most superior is the artery, in the middle is bronchus, and inferior is the vein. You have to be careful that we are talking about inferior pulmonary vein here. Because superior to inferior, it will come in relation. The superior pulmonary vein is much more anterior, so we don't consider it in this order. The question is asking, name these structures superior to inferior, and we are excluding including the superior pulmonary vein because it is much more anterior. It is the inferior pulmonary vein which will come in this line. And we are mentioning Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Atal, the artery. Bihari, the bronchus. Vajpayee, the vein. So you can draw it yourself as well. Say this is the midline of the body. And this is the front view of the left lung hilum. We are mentioning Atal Bihari Vajpayee in the superior to inferior direction. A, Atal is for the artery, the pulmonary artery more superior b bihari is for the bronchus and then we are talking about the v v is the vein but the inferior pulmonary vein in superior to inferior direction but this is for the left lung what about the right lung it'll be easier for you to remember the detail for the right lung as well it is actually the same so you can mention here again the atal bihari watch pay your mnemonic most superior is the pulmonary artery and then we we have got the bronchus and then inferiorly we have inferior pulmonary vein but then if you remember we have discussed already since the right principal bronchus is short it has divided into two one bronchus above the artery epi arterial bronchus one bronchus below the artery the hypo arterial bronchus so if you are looking at the hilum of the right lung it is the most superior structure will be bronchus epi arterial bronchus then the artery and then the hypo arterial arterial bronchus and then the vein so what you are doing is simply put one bronchus above the artery and your job is done and this bronchus we are calling it as epi arterial bronchus so if this is the epi arterial bronchus this must be the hypo arterial bronchus and hence the order at the right lung hilum superior to inferior remains atal bihari vajpayee with one addition that above the artery there is one bronchus the epi arterial bronchus bronchus otherwise the mnemonic holds true now this was superior to inferior arrangement of structures at the lung hilum what about the question let us go back to the question and as you can understand the arrangement of the structures in anterior to posterior relation we have already mentioned thinner most structures are anterior the veins then comes the thick wall arteries and then the thicker most wall the bronchus is most posterior any structure which has thin wall better you keep it more superficial thicker wall structures can be put more deeper posterior so this is v a b anterior to posterior 
But what about the bronchial arteries? When it comes to bronchial arteries, they are going to supply the bronchus and they make a circular anastomosis around the bronchus. But Gray's anatomy says mostly on the posterior side of bronchus. So this bronchus is having a circular anastomosis by the bronchial arteries. But these bronchial arteries are mostly posterior or dorsal to the bronchus. Hence, you will find your answer now. First of all, search for the vein and we see pulmonary vein is in choice AB and after that artery. So choice B cannot be the answer. Choice A, the pulmonary vein behind that is pulmonary artery. Behind that is the bronchus and then bronchial artery. So choice number A is our answer here. You can also see that in our diagram, which is a transverse section taken at the level of the lung hilum. But keeping your answer as choice number A and then looking at the diagram, you have taken a transverse section at the level of lung hilum and it is understood this is the vertebra and tier to vertebra is the tracheal bifurcation that is where we have the carina at the tracheal bifurcation this is the left principal bronchus this is the right principal bronchus you can demarcate them here now as you mentioned this is the left principal bronchus right principal bronchus more anteriorly the right ventricle is sending the pulmonary artery dividing into left pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery so as we have discussed the trachea will bring air into lung and then the pulmonary artery will bring the oxygenated blood into lung which will be oxygenated set back towards the heart by the pulmonary veins and as you see pulmonary veins they have thin wall they are kept more anteriorly this is the pulmonary vein and you can see the arrangement v a b anterior to posterior at the lung hilum the most anterior structure is the pulmonary vein behind that is pulmonary artery and most posterior is the bronchus v a b anterior to posterior in the present question, we are having a post-op case after laparoscopic hernia surgery and there is some altered sensation at the root of the penis. Now, there are some nerves which are mentioned and we have to find the most probable answer here. But before we do that, let us look at the details of these nerves first. And we have to start from the lumbar plexus. In the lumbar plexus, the L1 root value is carried by two nerves shown in this diagram. The one which runs higher is the iliohypogastric nerve and the one which runs lower is the ilioinguinal nerve. Both of them carry L1 root value, the anterior primary ramus of the lumbar plexus. Now these nerves, they have to puncture the internal oblique muscle and then supply the skin in this region, lower abdomen, the scrotum, upper medial thigh. In that process, it is seen the ilioinguinal nerve not only punctures the internal oblique muscle it has entered the inguinal canal and runs along with the spermatic cord comes out of the superficial inguinal ring along with the spermatic cord now what about their cutaneous supply it is observed that iliohypogastric nerve is slightly higher as compared with the ilioinguinal nerve which is slightly lower so this iliohypogastric nerve cutaneous supply is in the lower abdomen region we can shade the area and mention this is the territory of iliohypogastric nerve. Now below that will be ilioinguinal nerve which is supplying the upper and medial thigh. So we are shading the upper and medial thigh but then it is also supplying the anterior part of the scrotum and the root of the penis. So this ilioinguinal nerve not only supply upper medial thigh but also anterior part of the scrotum and root of the penis. The diagram you can draw yourself here. Say this is the scrotum that is the penile shaft here and the ilioinguinal nerve is supplying anterior part of the scrotum as well as the root of the penis and what about the female in the female it will be supplying the anterior one third of the labia majora and the root of the clitoris so it has similar cutaneous supply in male or female it is to be understood this anterior one third of scrotum or the labia majora in female and the root of penis in male 
male or root of clitoris in female has one additional supply along with this ileoinguinal nerve. So which nerve is additionally supplying these regions? That is the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. If a question comes, ileoinguinal nerve should be your first answer, but it is also being supplied by genital branch of genitofemoral nerve, which we can discuss here now. As we see, this genital femoral nerve is also coming from the lumbar plexus bearing the root value L1 and is piercing the psoas major muscle. Then it divides into two branches. The name is genital branch and the femoral branch. The femoral branch goes to anterior thigh and supply the skin on the anterior thigh whereas the genital branch goes towards the genital region and that genital branch of genitofemoral nerve is the one which is supplying the anterior one third of scrotum or labia majora plus the root of penis or clitoris in addition to ileoinguinal nerve. Now the same thing you can mention here, genital branch of genitofemoral nerve is the additional nerve which is supplying these regions along with ileoinguinal nerve. But if you to choose between the two, the first answer should always be ileoinguinal nerve. Now what about the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve? Let us shade the area of anterior thigh it is supplying and that is what you can show here. This is the region as you are telling the femoral branch of genitofemoral nerve is supplying skin on the anterior thigh whereas the genital branch is supplying the skin on the anterior one third scrotum or labia majora, root of penis or clitoris. So this was about genitofemoral nerve. Now once we have described the two branches of genitofemoral nerve, what about the other cutaneous territory here? The upper medial thigh is being supplied by ileoinguinal nerve. What about this area here in the medial thigh? That is the territory of obturator nerve cutaneous supply. So we can mention this is the territory of obturator nerve cutaneous supply in the medial thigh. What about the medial side of the leg? The medial malleolus. That is the territory of saphenous nerve branch of the femoral nerve. So here, if you're talking about the medial leg, the medial malleolus cutaneous supply, that is saphenous nerve territory branch of the femoral nerve. Now, we have mentioned the upper anterior thigh is supplied by femoral branch genitofemoral nerve. What about the lower anterior thigh? There you have branches of the femoral nerve. So as you see, the medial and intermediate femoral cutaneous nerve branches of the femoral nerve, they are supplying this territory of the thigh. And what about the lateral thigh? Laterally we have lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and this lateral femoral cutaneous nerve which is supplying the lateral aspect of the thigh can be involved in laparoscopic hernia repair leading to what is called as myralgia paresthetica. Now we have to understand when we are talking about laparoscopic hernia repair two nerves can be involved. Number one the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. If it is involved, there will be sensory disturbance in the lateral aspect of the thigh, what is called as myalgia paresthetica. So this is number one nerve to be damaged in laparoscopic hernia repair. Number two is the genitofemoral nerve. So one we have mentioned here. Number two, laparoscopic surgery repair, this nerve can be damaged. And what if it is open hernia repair? In open hernia repair, the most commonly damaged nerve is the ileoinguinal nerve. So you can mention here number one ileoinguinal nerve you can mention it as A and which is the next one number B ileohypogastric and which is the next one number C genital branch of genitofemoral nerve so we are mentioning if we are doing open hernia repair the nerves damaged are most commonly ileoinguinal compromising upper medial thigh and the anterior scrotum root of penis as well and number two it is the ileohypogastric nerve lower abdomen cutaneous supply will be compromised and number three, it is the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve having the similar territory as ileoinguinal nerve. And once we have this information with us, we can go back to our question, which is asking it is a post-op case laparoscopic hernia repair. So which are the most commonly damaged nerve? Number one, the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. And number two, genitofemoral nerve. But then in this question, they have specifically mentioned about the the altered sensation at the root of penis. Which nerve supply the root of penis? They are the ileoinguinal nerve and the genital branch of genitofemoral 
muscle nerve. So, what do you think is the answer? We understand these nerves are compromised if we are doing the open hernia repair. But this is not open hernia repair. This is laparoscopic. So, you mean to say it has damaged the genitofemoral nerve. That is why the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve is not working. Yes, that is what is the answer. The answer to this question is genitofemoral nerve. It's the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve which supply the skin at the root of penis and hence it has been compromised. Here we have got one question which is asking us which of the following statement will be incorrect regarding labor pain. As we understand labor is stage 1 and stage 2 in stage 1 there will be uterine contraction and in stage 2 the baby will be passing through the vaginal canal. Keeping that in mind there are some of the details which we first need to discuss before we reach our answer here. Now this is the diagram which is going to talk about the autonomic nervous system supply to the pelvic viscera as well as the somatic nerve supply. Pelvic viscera are urinary bladder, behind that is the uterus, behind that is the rectum and mostly they'll have the smooth muscles supplied by autonomic nervous system. But as we go more inferiorly there are some skeletal muscles at the opening. Skeletal muscles means there'll be somatic nervous system. But before we start talking about the somatic nervous system let us focus upon autonomic nervous system and specifically the uterus. This is the uterus this is the vagina. Now for the pelvic viscera we have got one Frankenhauser plexus which will have not only parasympathetic supply but also sympathetic supply. So what is the sympathetic root value going to supply the Frankenhauser plexus and the pelvic viscera? You can just remember it is T12 plus minus 2. When you say T12 plus minus 2 it is the sympathetic flow which is coming from the spinal cord having the root value T10, 11, 12 and L12. And if you are talking about the uterus, it is more towards the lower value. That means T12 plus minus 2, T12 11 2 is more preferable answer for the uterus. Now that was about the sympathetic supply, the motor supply. What will be the sympathetic supply doing to the uterus? Normally sympathetic system is for storage like urinary storage, fecal storage by reducing peristalsis. But for the uterus, it is exactly the opposite. For the uterus, the sympathetic system is not for storage. It is working for evacuation. It will increase the uterine contraction. Now, when you say the sympathetic system is increasing the contraction, do we really think that the uterine contraction depend upon autonomic nervous system? Actually, uterine contractions depend upon the hormonal influence, the oxytocin. It is oxytocin which causes the uterine contraction. But then definitely autonomic nervous system has some effect. And then if you say sympathetic system is for increasing the contraction, obviously parasympathetic system will oppose it. It will be relaxing the uterine musculature. Now what is the parasympathetic supply to pelvic viscera? That is nervi erigentes with root value S234. The craniosacral flow, parasympathetic flow. So S234 which is the nervi erigentes or also called pelvic splattening nerve what they will be doing to uterus. They will oppose the sympathetic system. You mean to say they will be relaxing the uterine musculature? Yes. And this Frankenhauser plexus which is on the lateral aspect of the pelvic viscera will have not only parasympathetic supply but also sympathetic supply. For sympathetic supply you can remember the nerves. They are called as lumbar splanchnic nerves. So it is the lumbar splanchnic nerve chiefly bearing the root value T12 L12 they will be coming via inferior mesenteric plexus, hypogastric plexus and Frankenhauser plexus to contract the uterus which is being opposed by the nervi erigentes S234. Now this was about the autonomic nervous system. What about the lower portion which is the opening in the perineum? When the vagina is opening in the perineum that is where we will have the skeletal muscles and those skeletal muscles will be under the somatic nervous system that is pudendal nerve. Pudendal nerve is the nerve of the perineum where we have the opening of the urethra, vagina,
vagina and the anus covered by some of the skeletal muscles. And what is the root value of pudendal nerve? Root value of pudendal nerve is same as the nerva irrigantes, that is S234. Now, once you have discussed about the motor control, what about the sensory supply? For sensory supply, we have to draw a diagram here. Say this is the uterus, this is the cervix, that is the vagina, and here we draw pelvic pain line, which is also peritoneal line. Now, what is this pelvic pain line or peritoneal line? Above this line, the uterus is covered by peritoneum, but below this, there is no peritoneum. These structures are subperitoneal, and that decides the pain. The pain above this line is carried by sympathetic system, lumbar splanking nerve, which we have mentioned here, and pain below this line is carried by nervi erigentes, the parasympathetic nerve, which we have mentioned here. So we can now put them in the diagram. Pain of uterus above this line is carried by lumbar splanking nerve and will be referred pain in the T12 L12 segment, which is basically the renal angle T12 and L12 is anteromedial thigh. So my point is, whenever there is uterine contraction, say stage 1 of the labor, the pain is carried only by sympathetic system, lumbar splanking nerve, root value T12, L12, and referred pain is felt in T12 dermatome. T12 dermatome is the renal angle, and L12 is anteromedial thigh. If you are planning to operate for cesarean section, you have to block these nerves. And what if I want to do painless vaginal delivery? For painless vaginal delivery, you have to block the nerves which carry pain from this lower region. And they are the Y erigentes. So you can mention the nerves carrying pain below this peritoneal line or pelvic pain line are nervi erigentes with the root value as 2, 3, 4 and you will have to block this nervi erigentes if you are planning for painless vaginal delivery. And what if I am doing the episiotomy? Episiotomy you are doing in the perineum region and for that purpose you have to block the nerve which is at the opening. It is now a somatic nerve and this is called as the pudendal nerve. So you have to block the pudendal nerve to do episiotomy. So there are three levels which we can mention. Stage one, you basically talk about uterine contraction, fundal contraction, pushing the baby towards the vaginal canal and this pain is by lumbar splanking nerve. T12 L12. When the baby is in stage two passing through the vaginal canal, the pain will be referred to as 234 which is the posterior thigh and the opening of the vagina or the urethra or the anus because that is where we have the dermatome S234. Anyhow, even these sensations, though carried by several nerves, they have to pass through Frankenhauser plexus only. So this was for the motor component and this was for the sensory component. Our question is on both. Let us look at further details now. As you can see, if we are talking about first stage of labor, the pain pathway, it is by the segment T12 plus minus 2. But more specifically, T12, L12, lumbar splanking nerves, they are carrying the pain. As we have mentioned, the pelvic pain line or peritoneal pain line. These are the lumbar splanking nerves, T12, L12, carrying the pain in the first stage of labor. Now, when the baby is passing through the vagina, second stage of labor, that time, if you want to block, you need to block the nervi erigentes with S234 root value. These are subperitoneal structures. And you can actually block both of them if you are giving lumbar epidural block, maintaining the levels of the tilting table. So, as you give lumbar epidural block, which is commonly the procedure for cesarean section or for painless vaginal delivery as well, you will see that it is taking care of the first stage as well as second stage to kill the pain of the labor. Now, if you don't want to block the uterine contraction because that might affect the delivery of the baby, then you can specifically not focus here and just try to block the nervi erigentes, which can be done by giving a para cervical block through the vaginal phonesis. This time you are blocking only the S234 and you are sparing the uterus. You don't want the uterine contraction to be affected. But then it is not so well established. And when you are talking about episiotomy, that time you have to block the pudendal nerve, the somatic nerve. Though bearing root value S234, 
three, four. It is supplying only the skin around the opening of vagina, urinary bladder, and the anal canal, the perineum region. Anyhow, let us go back to our question now, which is asking us to identify the incorrect statement. Now, early labor pain, that is the stage one, uterine contraction. So, of course, it is uterine origin. There is a fundal contraction pushing the baby down. And what about the motor innervation? Is it T7-8? No, it is not. We have discussed the sympathetic supply to uterus is T12 plus minus 2, which is T10, 11, 12, and 11, 2. In that also, T12, 11, 2 is more preferable because that is the nerve, lumbar, splanchnic nerves. So it cannot be T7, 8. It is starting with T10, 11, 12, and 11, 2. More specifically, T12, 11, 2. And this sympathetic system is not for storage. For the genital system, it is reverse. It will cause uterine contraction. Then, if it is the answer, what about choice number C? Pain in the first stage of labor carried by T10, 11, 12? Yes, it is uterine contraction. And the uterus pain is carried by lumbar splanchnic nerve felt in the loin and groin. T12, 11, 2. Renal angle, anterior medial thigh. No problem with choice number C. Then, sense innervation of uterus, cervix, upper vagina is from Frankenhauser ganglion. Frankenhauser ganglion is the ganglion which is supplying pelvic viscera, the urinary bladder, uterus and rectum. It has sympathetic supply as well as parasympathetic supply. Sympathetic supply we have discussed it is T12 plus minus 2 and parasympathetic we have discussed nerve irrigation T is S234. So no problem with choice number D. The only incorrect statement is choice number B because it is starting with the root value T10 onwards. Here we find one question asking us about a ligament which is connecting the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal. And the answer to this question would be the lis frank ligament. It is the lis frank ligament which is connecting the medial cuneiform and the second metatarsal as will be evident in the next diagram. Here we are looking from the superior view of the foot. This is the medial aspect, the great toe. On the lateral aspect, we will have the little toe. Towards the lateral side, we will have the lateral mellus, the fibula bone lower end. On the medial side, we will have the medial mellus, the tibia bone. You can and mark them here. This is the medial mellus, the tibia bone lower end. This is the lateral mellus, the fibula bone. Then you can see two bones are overlapping. The bone, which is heel bone, is evident here, the calcaneum. And sitting over that is the talus bone. This is the head of the talus bone. Talus is articulating with the navicular bone on the medial side, whereas the calcaneum is articulating with the lateral bone. That will be the cubic bone. Then we have to talk about the three cuneiforms, medial, intermediate and lateral cuneiform, which you can show as the medial cuneiform and the intermediate cuneiform and the lateral cuneiform. They are overlapping. We can also talk about the first metatarsal bone here. This is MT1 and then comes the MT2, metatarsal number 2. So our question was asking, what is the name of the ligament which is connecting the medial cuneiform? form with metatarsal number 2 and this is going to be the lis frank ligament connecting medial cuneiform with the metatarsal number 2 and lis frank ligament has three component there is one dorsal component there is one middle interosseous ligament and then there is a plantar component also which you can see here the medial cuneiform can also be called as cuneiform number 1 so this is the cuneiform number 1 and then metatarsal number 2 is shown here here. So between the cuneiform number one of medial cuneiform and then metatarsal two, this is the ligament having three components. One is dorsal, which is evident here, and one will be in the middle, which is interosseous, shown here. And then there is one towards the sole of plantar, and that is shown here. This plantar component is not only connected to the metatarsal two, but it is connected to metatarsal number three as well, which is more lateral. So talking about the Lisch-Frank ligament, we have got one clinical situation and we are looking at that. This patient, he had a fall on the foot. The force is applied in such way that the metatarsal heads are now on the floor. Metatarsal phalangeal joint is going into dorsiflexion and this frank ligament has been compromised. The second metatarsal is going to 
dorsal. So the ligament which is broken as we have understood the first cuneiform or medial cuneiform connected to the second metatarsal list frank ligament has been compromised. Now let us talk about the other ligaments also mentioned in the question. Here we are looking from the medial aspect of the ankle which will show medial medulla, lower end of the tibia, heel bone will be calcaneum and between the two will be the talus bone. So as you see this is the lower end of the tibia, medial mellus, calcaneum bone is heel bone, between the two is the talus bone. In front of talus you have the navicular bone which is medial bone whereas calcaneum is articulating with the cuboid bone laterally. Now we understand the calcaneum bone, the heel bone will have a medial projection which is called sustentaculum talus and several ligaments are attaching here. One of the ligaments which is attaching to sustentaculum talus of the calcaneum bone is the spring ligament which is also called calcaneo navicular ligament. So coming from calcaneum bone to the navicular bone, calcaneo navicular ligament is the spring ligament which is supporting the head of the talus. It is an important ligament to maintain the medial longitudinal arch also and it is a component of the Chopart's joint. Now what about this Chopart's joint? What about its ligaments? Spring ligament is a component of Chopart's joint and Chopart joint is basically the joint between proximal two bone that is talus and calcaneum with the distal bones that is the navicular and the cuboid bone. So as you will see in this diagram this talus bone is proximal, calcaneum bone is proximal and then they are articulating with navicular bone which is distal and cuboid bone which is distal. So this joint which is the Chopart joint it will have several ligaments. One of that is the spring ligament. In this joint we have to include talo calcaneo navicular joint which is a ball and socket synovial joint maintaining medial longitudinal arch and then calcaneo cuboid joint which is a saddle synovial joint maintaining lateral longitudinal arch. Let us look at one more diagram explaining the same. So here is the Chopart's joint which is also called transverse tarsal joint lying between the proximal bones like talus calcaneum and the distal bones which are navicular and the cuboid. In this joint will have some further components like talo calcaneo navicular joint, ball and socket joint for maintaining medial longitudinal arch and the CC joint calcaneo cuboid joint lateral longitudinal arch joint and several ligaments are involved in this Chopart joint. One of that we have already discussed the spring ligament calcaneo navicular but then there are several others to be discussed and we are not going to focus upon them. We just want to discuss one more ligament that is the deltoid ligament as per our question and this deltoid ligament is actually attaching to medial mellus lower end of the tibia has four components and what are the four components let us show them here this is the lower end of the tibia this is the medial mellus below that is the talus bone and the most inferior or the heel bone is the calcaneum and we can also show the navicular bone here then we can talk about the deltoid ligament having four components you can see there is one anterior tibiotellar component, posterior tibiotellar component, tibiocalcaneal component which will be coming on to sustentaculum talus of the calcaneum and then one is tibionavicular component. So this is the deltoid ligament which is having four components anterior posterior tibiotellar, tibiocalcaneal and tibionavicular stabilizing the medial aspect of the ankle joint that is the deltoid ligament and coming back to the question asking the ligament which is connecting the medial cuneiform or cuneiform number one with the second metatarsal none other than the Lisfranc ligament as we have mentioned it can be damaged if there is a fall on the foot extreme dorsiflexion at the metatarsal phalangeal joint the second metatarsal will be dislocated dorsal breaking the Lisfranc ligament. Spring ligament is a component of Chopart ligament itself whereas deltoid ligament is on the medial aspect having four components all attaching to tibia hence the names are tibiotellar, tibiocalcaneal, tibionavicular. Here we'll keep our answer as choice number D.